Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. A strange few days at Tottenham Hotspur. I guess, when is it never not strange? Lots of double negatives going on there. But it's just such a funny club. Um, so we've got kind of quite a bit to talk about, even though there hasn't been another match. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's weird. Let's start with the biggest thing that's probably happened this week, uh, or last week technically, the Qatar meeting. Um, you know I was kind of briefly touched on that and you would have been able to tell that I, I think I said something like about the club are denying it but that's what you would say I think I said something along those lines because you would at that stage in any kind of early talks um, I think you could tell I probably wasn't entirely sold on that uh, denial although I should stress Tottenham continue to categorically state that no such talks took place, um, or certainly no talks about equity in the club, equity. Um, but obviously, that was all happening pretty much as I was about to start the video. So it was kind of very much like first impressions. Um, and it was a very quick denial, which kind of made me slightly, uh, not, I don't want to say dubious. Well, I guess it was, but well, you could probably tell. So I went away and did some digging, uh, spoke to various people kind of on both sides of it um, and other stuff and kind of pieced together my understanding of what happened. Spurs, as I say, absolutely not is their stance um, for, from what I understand. And I think you're finding that a lot of other uh, journalists are also kind of been writing reports as well um, in the aftermath. Um, I think fair play to, I think it was Ben Jacobs from CBS Sports did the first one. Um, and then, I don't know if I got in there next or someone else, but I started to kind of flesh out more of the stuff that kind of happened in the meeting that I could find out as well. So, sorry, the meeting that didn't take place, according to Tottenham Hotspur, I should, I should stress that. This is only my understanding um, before I sort of get a knock at the door. Um but I don't know. I don't know. Would they? I was about to say, kind of holding a pitchforks and flaming torches with. Uh, I don't know if you get Tottenham branded uh, pitchforks, but maybe they do. Maybe in a club shop. Uh, so yes. So from what I understand, Daniel Levy met with uh, Qatar Sports Investment, the head of that organisation, Nasser Al Khalifi. Khalifi. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. You would probably know him better as the. Um, is he owner? I think technically owner. Um, yeah, owner of PSG. Um, obviously a very famous man nowadays because of his involvement in PSG. So, um, yeah, they met in a London hotel last week, my understanding. Um, and the subject of investing in the club was brought up among many topics that were spoken about. So just for a little bit of background information for you. Uh, Levy and Al Khalifi are absolutely awful at pronouncing names, as you know. They've been friends for years. Um, obviously, done a fair bit of business uh, between each other. PSG and Spurs. Obviously, Spurs signed Lucas Serge Aurier. I'm trying to think of anyone else went either way. Obviously, Poch eventually ended up at PSG. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think. I don't think there are any, any others. Unless I'm missing, please put them in the comments if you think of any other kind of crossovers. It's not just in the transfer market. There is also um, a kind of common stamping ground, which is the ECA, which is the European Club Association. Um, so I think, I'm pretty sure Al Khalifi could even... Al, Al Khalifi, Khalifi. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to murder that so many times, that pronunciation. I feel like he's the head of that as well, maybe the chairman of that. I sh I'm really sure I've written it down somewhere, but I clearly haven't. Um, but he is anyway the um, the chairman of the Qatar Sports Investment. Um, yeah, so they have met many times. Levy is also, I think, involved in the ECA. He might even be on the board. So these two have kind of got a good friendship, relationship, whatever you want to call it. They've met many times over the years, whenever... They happened to be in the same city. Apparently they arranged to meet. Um, and Levy was out there. for There was an ECA meeting at the start of December. And he was out there. Although I'm told during that visit, nothing was mentioned about investing in Spurs or anything like that. I think there may have also been another 
um, trip to Qatar at some point um, last month, maybe, for Daniel Levy. Maybe during, maybe later in the month. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that they kind of, they they mix and mingle, I guess is the way to put They meet uh, a fair bit. Um, from what I understand, this latest meeting was a mutually arranged one in this London hotel. Um, and the main topic of the agenda of the meeting, or one of the main topics, was that the uh, there's a new joint venture between the ECA and UEFA, which is essentially it covers media rights sales without getting too boring with it. It's, it covers media rights sales um, and UEFA club competitions, so the Champions League, Europa League, Europa Conference League. Um, and it, short story. Long story short, it boosts revenue streams a lot. It's a new thing that the uh, two organisations are putting their heads together to do. It starts after 2024, and it will bring a lot more money in for the club. So apparently, although um, Al Khalifa was there as uh, in his QSI, as they're called, um, capacity, I think just as mutual members of the ECS, ECA, they were also speaking about that. It was one of the main topics However, I understand, and this is a point that Spurs very much deny, I understand, um, and others seem to understand as well, that talk turned to the possibility of QSI investing in Spurs. Um, and from what I understand, this is the second time that they've uh, had a little conversation or topics have turned towards that. Again, Spurs absolutely deny this is, is the case whatsoever. Um yeah, I should stress that from every person I've talked to involved in this or has any knowledge of anything in this, very early doors, very much preliminary, and it may not go anywhere. I must stress that before people get excited about, you know, billion-dollar signings or whatever. Um, I wonder if there'll ever be a billion-dollar signing. I hope not, because football will have gone absolutely insane if it has. Um, maybe in the year 2085 or something. Um, but yeah, so just to give you a little bit of an understanding of QSI, it's much easier than saying Qatar Sports Investment, um, they own PSG, um, but they also only own Braga, as in, when I say only, it's because if you think of the City group, obviously they own Man City, and then they've got New York City, I think there's Melbourne City, the City group essentially have a big kind of multi-club portfolio, whereas uh, QSI... They just have PSG and there's 23, it's either 22 or 23 percent stake in Braga in Portugal. Um, I think they also own a paddle board or paddle tournament. Can't remember. There's some some kind of tournament as well. Um, but since the World Cup and exposure to the World Cup, they are looking to expand their brand, I guess, to in a way go down the city group kind of route and, and trying to have um, I guess more investments across the game. Um, and they want to really increase their ambitions. And one of the areas they've looked at, of course, because of the luster and glamour of it all, is the Premier League. So I think they've uh, kind of uh, have sounded out a few clubs. Um, obviously, Tottenham being one of them, Spurs categorically deny. I'm going to keep saying that because uh, it, it keeps the angry hordes from the door. Um, but yeah. The thing I should also state is that this would not be a buyout. This would not be a takeover. Um, the European, I think it's UEFA rules, prevent you from owning more than one place. So they'd have to, a club. They'd have to sell their stake in PSG, which doesn't look likely to happen at all, because um, you can only then have a part stake in another club. So that's what it would be if it ever came to fruition. Um from what I understand, because I know some people have wondered whether this was the case, from what I understand, there was no discussions about naming rights to the stadium. Um, that's not an intention at all. Apparently, it's not kind of what the aim of this QSI is. It's not an aim to kind of advertise in a way. It's what it, it well, it's exactly what it is. It's an investment thing. So it's looking to increase its investment, not to, I guess, I guess it's kind of promoting Qatar in a way, but it's not. Um, it's not that obvious, I guess. I think, if I'm not mistaken, the Parc de Prince is the PSG stadium. I don't think has a sponsor, which clearly it would do, you'd think, if they were that fussed about it. I've got a funny feeling Braga's maybe isn't as well. So, yeah, I don't think that's um, 
well, sorry, I know that that wasn't discussed. That wasn't one of the things that was uh, was spoken about in this meeting that never took place. Um, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, there's no indications at this point that discussions have got any further and that they'll lead to anything at this point. They may do. They may well do. But at this point, very much preliminary stuff. Or if you're Tottenham Hotspur, nothing, apparently. Um and, you know, other clubs may end up being the kind of focus of QSI. And I've kind of also heard some suggestions, um, certainly from um, the other side of the table, um, you know, the Qatar side of the table, that there's a feeling that maybe, um, you know, Spurs, perhaps there's another couple of interested parties in, at their end that maybe um, Spurs have, have had some discussions with about um, investment in the club or interested parties I should say rather than discussions but if they're interesting I'm sure if they're interested I'm sure there have been discussions um so yeah we'll see where it all leads to it's an interesting one the whole part stake thing because in one aspect it um injects money into the club which of course when you're trying to compete with all of these mega rich clubs that's a great thing the other slight negative if you're an owner is I guess it makes it more difficult to sell the club eventually because obviously you're you're not kind of the full majority owner. There's someone that has a bigger stake that has to be convinced as well. So it does make that slightly more difficult. Um, so yeah, we shall see what becomes of it. Not that it ever happened, apparently, according to Tottenham Hotspur. Um, but that's the fun of covering Tottenham Hotspur. Uh, so yeah. So that's pretty much all we can really say about that at the moment. <laughs> that's in like Forest Gump, isn't it? And that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, so, yeah. Make of it what you will. Um, there's so many sides to, bit, uh, sides to it. There's, of course, there's lots of aspects about the... Obviously, we know about the, the, the whole uh, controversy with the World Cup in Qatar as well. And... You know, there's going to be a lot of people that I think would be upset at such a move. There'll be a lot of people that'd be excited by such a move. It would be one that would become a big talking point. Um, probably one for a future video to really kind of delve into, but probably one for if it does become anything or it looks like it's going to become something. But like I say, right now, indications are very much, um, let's see where this goes, because it could be nothing. Um, but yeah. The meeting that never took place, apparently, according to Tottenham Hotspur. Um, so there you go. So what else we got? Financial results. <sighs> um, yeah. <laughs> uh, another one that's just Tottenham Hotspur in a nutshell. So let's start the the beginning of this aspect. Um, Tottenham Hotspur Supporters Trust. They, if you didn't see, put out four questions to the board that they felt needed to be answered. Um it was probably slightly unfortunate timing in that it went out after the 4-0 win against Palace, whereas it probably, if they, I, you know, I don't know about time frames and all that sort of stuff, but obviously it got slightly lost or buried a little bit in the fact that Spurs had won a game, whereas obviously maybe when a couple of days before, it would have been fully when everyone was really kind of annoyed at everything. That's not to say I know there's people that are still very annoyed, um, but just, yeah, it was just unfortunate timing wise. It got slightly buried. Uh, so if you weren't aware, that's why I'm kind of highlighting it now. Uh, their questions were, number one, will the club share their medium and long-term strategy for success, both on and off the pitch? How are you measuring progress and how do you judge current outcomes? Question two, we have a manager who's not signed a new contract and tells us that we should lower our expectations about on-field outcomes. Furthermore, he appears to be unsupportive of some recent transfers and he tells us the club needs to spend big money every window just to compete. How does this align with the board's philosophy for achieving success? Question three. Are you satisfied with the performance of the youth teams and the development and supply of younger players through to the first team? Four. This final question. Does the club have a plan for further investment to ensure that they remain competitive on the pitch? Are we closer to securing a naming rights provider? And, and are we expecting further investment from Enoch or other potential investors or buyers? So good questions. All very good questions. Um, and the club did respond in a way, um, kind of. The club has committed, this is what the trust put out, the club has committed to provide a response in the coming weeks. The club says it is very keen to address the issues raised, but for commercial reasons will not be able to do this during the transfer window. 
In the meantime, the club's financial results will be released in February. And there will be a statement from Fabio Paratici on the completion of the transfer window. The club will respond in full to our questions at that point. So, okay, right. The main bit for me, of course, is the financial results. Um, because if you've been watching these videos, you know very well that I've been saying, and I've been told this from various people inside and around the club, that those, uh, the financial kind of results, uh, whatever you want to call it, statement, um, have been pretty much all done and dusted for a little while now. Um, you know, just like kind of, what do they call it? Dotting the uh, I's and crossing the T's and stuff like that. But essentially been ready to go for a while. Um, so yes, the fact that we now find that they're going to come out not until February. Um, how do I put this? I think the, I don't, presumably, I would understand. I would assume the logic is that for selling clubs not to know how much money Spurs maybe have. Um, that that would be my thinking behind it. Um, my counter to that would be they're a Premier League club. Um, <laughs> most European sides assume that they've got a fair whack of money to spend. Um you know, I've said this before, but the statement that they put out when Enoch were putting in the capital increase of 150 million that was there to be used, drawn out in tranches until the end of the year. So I can't imagine a reason they wouldn't take that remaining 50 million. I mean, for Enoch, it gives them a little extra share of the club. Um, and of course, it dumps another 50 million into the club to be able to put towards improving the club and especially on the field so I can't understand a reason for not taking it um, so unless that's something they're trying to uh, keep under wraps so that teams don't suddenly whack another load of money on because they know they've got 50 million extra to play with I don't know um, I'd imagine we'll find out that the stadium you know I've said this a million times the stadium being open for most of that financial year should really be generating a lot of cash. That was the whole point of the stadium. So all the events, the NFL going, the boxing, um, rugby, concerts, everything that goes on there. And of course, the Premier League, which in itself is the biggest money-making machine that stadium can have. So, yeah, I'd imagine there'll be a fair bit of money that's come in. Um, I, just, I just don't know whether it's all being a bit overly sensitive. I just don't know. Um... I'd say if we get to the end of the window and they have a great transfer window, then fair enough. It was a master plan that worked. If it doesn't, it's just, it's just this is a thing with Spurs. They always come across as if they're trying to hide something. There's always this feeling of trying to hide things. Um, and yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a way to go. It's an interesting technique. Um, but the amount of times they seem to try to hide stuff and I, yeah, I don't think it does them any favours. I think it's the only way I can put it. Um, you know, if they have a bad one, um, I guess people... It's a, it's a really difficult one. I said Because it, 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 people go mad, I think, afterwards. If they have a bad transfer window, and afterwards it's found they, had, they generated loads of money, made a huge profit, and even did take that £50 million remaining, then people are just going to be like, why didn't you spend it? Why didn't you use that moment to invest and, and really improve the team? So I don't I don't know. I don't think you're getting away with it if you're just shoving it off there. That's my only thinking as to why it maybe isn't in their thinking. I don't know. I don't know. I, I always try to work out what goes on in the minds of people making decisions at Tottenham Hotspur sometimes, and I can't, especially from a PR perspective. I'm sorry, and I've said this before, but I think from a PR perspective, Spurs often are quite dreadful with their decisions. They often do things and you just think, oh no, why did you do that? Um, I don't always think they get the fans. I don't think they get what the fans like and what the fans are enraged by. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I, I've never, never always understood a lot of the things that are done. But there you go. It's football. You know, I'm sure... Uh, Hopefully, we're talking about it being a, a tactical masterclass of shielding financial results. <laughs> Can that be a tactical masterclass? We may find that out. Um, 
So yeah, we'll find out. But um, I can't. I can't understand you, you of you keeping it back if they were bad results. If you see what I mean, I'm just trying to find a logic for doing that, which can only suggest that there's money there to spend, and they don't want people to know. But as in, they don't want selling clubs to know that they've got a bit more to play with. Um, because yeah, why would you hide bad results? If anything, other clubs would clearly know that you haven't got a lot to play with, and I can't understand why there would be bad results. Um, but yeah, so transfer window, of course, Pedro Porro is going to continue to be a, a, a focus of things at the moment. It's a really interesting situation with him because, you know, I said it before, I suppose really like him, even with it, with those little doubts about maybe whether he's a, um, a Conte fullback or not in physicality wise. Um, but Sporting are just making it so clear that they will not let them go, him or, I think I saw a quote about Marcus Edwards as well, if anyone wanted him, that they will not let Porro go unless someone pays the release clause. Which, it's really awkward because it's one of those things where when you look at it straight at, and you kind of think, well, we'll just pay the release clause. But actually, when you delve a little bit deeper, it's slightly different because obviously with a release clause... Uh, Poros is 39.5 million, 45 million euros. Um, you need to pay the full whack, uh, the full amount up front, especially if you're a club that don't want to sell. You know, you're know, you not going to negotiate. You're going to go, all oh, right, then if you're going to give it to us, we'll have a pound a month. You know, It doesn't work like that. It's, it's got to be the full whack up. And I think, certainly in Spain, I think they have to register it with the league. I think the money has to go in and then the contract gets released or something like that. I'm not sure if it's the same in Portugal or not. But either way, it seems to be the indication in most of these deals is that it's the full amount up front. And that's just not a way that most clubs operate. Of course, you're incredibly rich clubs like your PSGs, your Man City, now your Newcastle, maybe Man U with the revenue that they create. But the majority of clubs, they will um, do stuff in installments. Even when you hear the term up front, Often, even that upfront fee is in bits. Um, so what you'll actually get, I put out a bit that I think people took slightly wrongly yesterday. I said that Spurs would look to compromise. They look to negotiate. And um, I think people automatically took that as, oh, they can't even afford the fee or they don't willing to pay the fee. Actually, when you negotiate in terms of, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, release calls, think of it as a simple word I've actually been talking about in the last few minutes, when you negotiate, sometimes clubs actually negotiate a higher fee than that because they are paying in bits. Um, I guess it's a bit like, I suppose, if you go into, I don't know, like Curry's or PC World or something, and I'm not, I'm not promoting anyone there, but any shop, if you go there but you buy it on finance, of course, the overall price is going to be a little bit more, which is similar, I suppose, to a player. Um, and yeah, so... Look, I understand the frustration, and I know there's people out there that are very much like, well, you must have the money. Just pay the full whack. But it is, I can't stress how rare that is actually a thing. Uh, and that's not me, you know, saying it's like, oh, like saying, oh, you know, Tottenham are paupers or anything like that. I don't think they are. I'm sure these next bunch of finances are going to show a much healthier Tottenham than you know during and and, and maybe even pre-pandemic because of the stadium being fully open um, but it does not take away from the fact that very few teams will ever pay a big fee up front um, you know even when it's a huge fee you probably find that a lot of that is in bits and pieces like I mean this isn't a huge fee but like the Benton Core fee it was payable within five years so even that, which is could only potentially with add-ons be, I think twenty million. Even that's in bits. Um, it's guaranteed. So that's why it's an upfront bit because it's guaranteed that you're going to pay those, and then the the uh, rest of it, or these things are add-ons, they uh, performance-related things and stuff like that. So yeah, it's interesting. When I say it's interesting, the Poro thing is because I've kind of spent this week speaking to loads of various agents connected with various aspects of the transfer window. Um, and I've had some of them, or a couple, have suggested that they think Poro is a smokescreen for another transfer. 
But I've also had other ones who have said that, oh, no, no, Porro is Spurs' main target. Um, so it'd be really interesting to see which way it goes because if Sporting are going to stand steady on this release clause thing, uh, thing that it would be interesting to see that it would test the resolve of whether Spurs do shake this, um, you know, the desire to do everything in installments um, or whether they just don't value him at that price. That may be the case as well. Um, but, you know, if it's someone that they do believe or Conte believes can be the perfect wing back for his system. Uh, and the other thing I should uh, stress as well with, um, with his fee, there is a, there's a suggestion. I don't, I honestly, I don't know if this is true. This is just a suggestion that if Porro was sold, is sold on within a certain amount of team that city might be due some money. Um, so whether that's another factor in having to have a full whack of money um, put in rather than instalments because some of it is going to City, I don't know. Again, that's just a suggestion. That's not something I've had absolutely um, 100% verified. So it may be that it's, it's, just a, it's just a thought, but that would also indicate why they'd be looking for the release clee, uh, release clee? <laughs> the release clause fee rather than the um, a negotiated one. So yeah, it may be. Um, and of course, the oh, sorry Chelsea. I should have added Chelsea to the list of teams that probably at the moment don't have to uh, worry too much about instalments. But this is the thing, isn't it? This is what Spurs are competing against now. It's massively cash-rich clubs, which is potentially why they're talk. <laughs> they deny it, but whether they would be talking to investors about pumping some more money in or not. Um, yeah, let's see what happens with Poro. As always with Spurs, you know. Who knows how long it could dra drag out for. And of course the other issue is they have about 75 different right wing backs at the moment. And that's got to be sorted. Um, when it comes to Emerson, Royale, I understand that you know there is interest from clubs in Spain and Italy for him. Um, potentially loan to buy deals. Um, but that's yet to materialise into anything concrete so far for him. Um, and interesting, kind of on the player's side, he, he's not believed to be pushing for a move. Um, apparent, from what I understand, he held talks with Conte last summer. I think Atletico Madrid were very interested in signing him. Um, and he had some talks with Conte and it was all decided that he would end up staying. Um, and yeah, from what I understand at the moment, he hasn't got any desire to kind of head off into the, uh, the distance and his people aren't looking to negotiate with any clubs or... Um, that was the best word, look to encourage any advances from clubs. But of course, from Spurs' perspective, from everything that I understand, they would be willing to listen to offers for him. Um, and, I, you know, I would little kind of got some words from Emerson Royale through, through a translator, um, but I got some words from him this week, which I did feel sorry for him. I did, not because he had to talk to me, um, although some people might feel that. But just obviously, when you think about the criticism he's had recently, um, you know, media as well, myself included, but also the fans, the booing when he comes on, the big cheers when he goes off. Um, his Instagram account has been an absolute mess. He has had to restrict the comments to only people he follows because he was getting so much abuse on there. Uh, his Twitter account, he hasn't posted on there since, what's that, August, so that's four or five months ago. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of asked about that. And this is what he said. This is through a translator, which is why the words, some of you might think, oh, that's an interesting word. Um, so it's not up to me to say whether the crowd's opinion is fair or not. The, there are people who pay, obviously, to watch matches, but there are many people in favour. I do not seek to see these questions about me. I prefer to focus on doing my best for the club. I prefer to dedicate myself 100% to what I can do. Sometimes things go well. Sometimes they don't, but it is not for lack of will and dedication. I never stop making an effort, trying to help my teammates and managing to sustain the happiness I have and put it on the field. I always try to do that. I understand all the manifestations of the fans. It is their role together. But you must understand about the player, his moment, will and repertoire. I'm trying to improve every day and live up to all the trust it motivates. I support myself a lot in the messages of affection I have received. And I must admit, it's like a bit like... Oh, you do got you do have to feel sorry for him because I and I have always stated this. The problem more so with Emerson Royale in the system 
is that he's being played out of position. It's as simple as that. I do think he's a solid right back. I do, and I've said this a million times. But as a wing back, it's just putting him in an unnatural, uncomfortable position. He is not a guy that's going to bring you assists. I think he's had one assist this season in 20-something games. I think in his entire time at Tottenham, I think he's had two or maybe three. Um, I did see the stats the other day. Um, and, you know, goal-wise, has he scored? Oh, I think he scored one. He maybe would have had two, but it ended up going down as an own goal. Um, but, yeah, from attacking senses. And he has tried so hard. You know, Tom Barkley from The Sun, who you know, I know very well, he, he did a piece. Um, he spoke to some of his people, and it was like, I think he, like between the player and his camp, they spent about eight hundred grand on trying things like a hyperbaric recovery chamber for him to because he's you know he's one of the fittest players out there. His, his recovery levels are superb. So he spent on that. He spent on scouting Hakimi, obviously a former Conte wing back, to try and understand better how to play the role. He has done everything, and you cannot lack um, fault his his effort. He has tried. But unfortunately, he's just, for me, a player that is, is being played out of position. Um, and that's why I think he gets a lot of his criticism. I would never condone abuse ever of a player. Ever, ever, ever. I, I, I think, personally, I think there's got to be something not quite right up there for you to actually go on. Like Even those words. I've put those words out um, in an uh, on in an article and then I tweeted it out. And I had people tagging Emerson in underneath telling him he was rubbish. I cannot for the life of me understand what goes through someone's head that they feel they need to do that. I don't get it. I never will. I'll never understand it. It, it. There's no... Unless you get a kick out of it, that's the only thing I can presume those people do because it's just nasty. It's nasty. Um, you know. But there you go. So, yeah. So, all of that. I'm intrigued to see again what happens with Emerson because this is a player that doesn't really want to give up on what he's trying to do um, at Spurs. And he does love the club. He's very popular. Um, he is, you know, he's a very positive influence in the dressing room. A few people have told me that. And that's what Conte does like about him, that he is a very driven, popular character. But obviously, you know, he's he's lost his spot at the moment. It is, Matt Doherty is the first choice, really. Um I guess it's it depends what he's told, and you know if Conte were to tell him that he wants to bring in someone else, and that doesn't seem to be from you know speaking to people around Emerson and people that know him, it doesn't seem to be that he's told his future is not at Tottenham. So uh, it's a funny world football, honestly. There can sometimes be a club have a certain thing they want to do, but what they tell the player can be completely different. And that's across football. That's, that's not just Tottenham. That is, yeah, it's. This is what I always say about when people say, like, you know, obviously I was brought up a Spurs fan, absolutely. Um, you know, my dad used to take me all the time. But when you kind of pull back the curtain and you see the grubby side of football and the way some people are treated, obviously there's a lot of good things done in football as well, but sometimes the way people are treated, you know. I know, you know, Martin Joel quite well, having done stuff with him in the past, and obviously we all know the way that ended for him at Spurs, and it was very, very unsavoury, left a very unpleasant taste in the mouth. Um, you know, I was, yeah, I was with a member of his, of his family the day he got um, sacked the Getafe match, wasn't it? Um, and honestly, just seeing the way things are done in football, it's not nice. And it does, it does take a little bit of romanticism away from it when you kind of, you do see behind that curtain. Um, so, yeah. So, we'll find out what happens next with Emerson. Obviously, there's Jed Spence as well. Um, yeah, I told you a couple of days ago that in the last video that Spurs still have to decide exactly what's happening with him and whether he is going out or whether he's going to stick around and continue to learn or not from those around. Um, Bayer Leverkusen, three Premier League clubs among those interested in him. No desire to send him back to the championship from the player or the club. Um, I think just Jed Spence is waiting to see what the club want to do, I suppose, and then go from there and make a decision based on that. So, But I can't see, and this is only opinion, I can't see how they sign Porro without someone going out. I can't see how they'd leave themselves in a position to have four right wing backs, but also Perisic, Kulisevsky, Lucas, if he ever gets fit again, that can all play there. It's such a bloated area of the squad it would be. 
Um, look, I understand there's people out there who are just like, get him, whatever, get him. Um, but in reality, it doesn't really work like that. So some, you know, one or maybe probably two would have to go out uh, to get him in. Uh, another link that I've seen this week, uh, Leandro Trossard. Um, yeah. From what I understand, I think he's been offering offered around a few clubs um, because I think there's maybe not going so well for him at the moment at Brighton, despite he's had a decent season. Um, seven goals, two assists in 16 Premier League games. So that's nine goal involvement in 16 Premier League games. He's had a good season so far. Um, I think he had a contract until the end of this season, but there's some reports that Brighton have taken the option to extend it by another 12 months. So he wouldn't be that expensive still, even with that on. Um, my thing with Trossard is that he's not really... He's 28, so he's not a normal Spurs profile signing, but I can absolutely see him as a Paratici Conte signing. They've That's the one good thing, I guess, about what Spurs have done is... Paratici and Conte, I do think, have a very similar view in players. I think they do on the whole. Um, I don't think Paratici is is one who will always look towards young players. I think he will try to for Spurs, but I do think his MO is maybe older players. You see a lot of free transfers at Juventus, you know, older players. Um, so I think he and Conte will look for more ready-made players if they can. Uh, so I guess that's a good thing, that they're aligned in that respect. Um, so Trossard for me would be one of those kind of players he, he's versatile, mainly plays down the left I think but he can also play in the centre so yeah you have that my only thing and I think I've said this sometimes about players before is it's all very well being linked with the player and the player thinking oh bigger club I could move on there but also if I'm Trossard and I'm looking at that Spurs squad I'm seeing that Son and Richarlison probably are ahead of me in the playing on the left role um, and obviously you've got Perisic can play there as well. So, yeah, it's one to keep an eye on, I think. I wouldn't rule it out because I do feel that it seems like a, a ready-made player who could been there and done it and is scoring goals in the Premier League. So if he was offered and it, it was a good price, I can't see why they wouldn't try. But I would also add on that that Spurs are going to be offered a lot of players in these weeks ahead, a lot you know, having spoken to agents, a lot of them, knowing many different ones, I know the way they work. I know the way they um, approach clubs with players to try to start a ball rolling, um, to try and... Sometimes it's to, you know, they readily admit this. Sometimes it's to engineer a new contract for their players. Sometimes it is generally to get them away. Sometimes it's to spark interest so that... Uh, a club that they know are really far more serious about them come in. It's such a a web of different things that happen in transfer. It is madness. It really is. Um, but yeah, now keep an eye on that. Like I said in the last video, I feel like we're going to start to see things kind of heating up now. Um, you know, like I've said before, right wing back and attacker. They're the two that I was told as a priority by quite a few people. Um and, you know, if there was an opportunity for a central midfielder or a centre-back that they think can't wait till the summer, then they'll try to do that if that's a possibility. But on the whole, I said before, the plan was for the summer. It was two centre-backs, one that can play on the left, one that can play central or right, probably right-footed. Um, a successor for Hugo Lloris for the long term. And also a... Um, yeah, central midfielder as well would be within that as well. So, yeah, we shall see. We shall see. Um, that's just reminded me, Hugo Lloris re retired from international football. World Cup winner. Can't, you know, if you're going to retire, retire with the World Cup as one of your things. Obviously, difficult for him that he, you know, didn't quite do it twice. It would have made history as the first male captain to get back to back World Cups. But, you know. He's retiring absolutely, having done it all in the international game. So fair play to him. Um, and obviously Gareth Bale retired as well, completely from everything. Um, obviously, incredible career. The most successful British player. Yeah, I think it has to be the most successful British player. I think you stop the sentence there. Obviously, is it four or five Champions Leagues? I'm trying to remember how many it was now. Um, done some incredible things. Um you know, 
some of the goals for Tottenham. My favourite will always be the goal against West Ham, just because of how big it was, how late it was, how you, you've always heard me say this before about big players taking a game by the scruff of the neck. He grabbed it by the scruff of the neck and absolutely hurled it that night. Honestly, you could see he was a bit knackered. He just arrowed that ball into the top right corner. Incredible goal. The one against Stoke from Aaron Lennon's cross is also a beauty. And of course, the goals against Inter Milan for Spurs were incredible. Um, but yeah, obviously, then went to Real Madrid and just silverware galore. Scored that wonderful goal in the, the Copa del Rey final. I think it was the one when he went off the pitch and ran back on. Brilliant player. Um, I'm gutted for you guys and girls that you didn't get to see him live um, really in that season. He came back on loan. I was very privileged to be able to see him and being in the stadiums because of the pandemic. You all couldn't. Um, that's not me rubbing it in your face. That is genuinely, I would have loved to have seen him play in front of a crowd. There is a slight sadness that he was clearly a slightly hampered Gareth Bale in the fact that you know, he was having lots of muscle problems. And even in training, I think there was varying levels of what he could do. And Mourinho, you know, he tried to manage that, uh, but also couldn't really rely on him in certain situations. But fair play to him. You know, he scored a fair whack of goals in the end. Was it was it 16? I'm trying to think it was 16 now. So 10 or 16. He, he, you know, he really did still manage to contribute despite those issues. Um and yeah, obviously they went to uh, LA as well, didn't he? And uh, and even won a trophy with them. So yeah, fair play to him. Incredible season. Um, definitely the right time to um, yeah. It's de it's definitely the uh, yeah. I guess it's the right time, isn't it? He's played at the World Cup. He's done a historic thing. Wales hadn't been there in um, in so long. Um, yeah, fair play, Gareth Bale. Honestly, gave me back in my just kind of before being a journalist, just being a Spurs fan days. Honestly, one of those players that you would love, absolutely love to watch playing. Um, incredible, incredible players. Um, yeah. So there you go. There you go. Uh, I was going to do a lone roundup. For anyone still with me, <laughs> um, after kind of waxing Liverpool, uh, Liverpool, waxing lyrical about Gareth Bale, um, just in case you weren't aware, there's I think it's eight lone players out, um, some very high profile ones, um, and some interesting little bits and pieces that happened this week. So I wanted to, see it. but while I was doing that, I just realised I didn't actually check to see how Dane Scarlett got on last night. So apologise for my slight unprofessional nature, but I want to see. Oh, uh, there we go. Okay, so when I talk about Dane, I know exactly what happened with him now. Although, oh, I don't know if he did actually even play. No, I don't think he did. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't even affect what I was going to say. Right, let's start with Destiny, you doggy. Um, obviously 20-year-old now. He's, he was 19 when Spurs signed him. He's now 20. Left wing back, uh, he missed Udinese's final three Serie A matches before the World Cup with a what's called a flexor muscle injury. Um, however, he's back. He returned with an assist last week um, in the 1-1 draw with Empoli. He got 81 minutes under his belt and on Saturday he played 69 minutes of the 1-0 def defeat at Juventus. Um, and after this game, Andrea Sotil, the Ud Udinese boss, he praised you doggy but he also said what he still needs to do and it's quite interesting so i wrote it down so we can read it out to you he is extraordinary he has to take care of the defensive phase and sometimes try to put fast balls in the middle without touching the ball too many times today he had limited playing time but he must be managed because he had a delicate injury we recovered him for tonight with a reduced playing time but he has grown a lot and that's a really good thing because i asked conte about udogi I think it was just after he signed and essentially asked him, like, is he a play for the future? And he very much seemed to be putting him in the bracket of Jed Spence, Brian Hill, Oliver Skip, these kind of players that can do a bit now, but mainly are for the future. But then I guess what Destiny, uh, your doggy's got over those guys is that he's going to play almost every match for Udinese. So he has a big season of properly developing. Um, he's played 13 times, scored twice, two assists. He's very much, you know, when we were speaking earlier about kind of the uh, 
Conte wanting his wing backs to also be wingers and also be there when the ball comes across from the other side to act like a, an auxiliary striker. That's exactly it. You know, four goal involvements in three Serie A games as a wing back. That's exactly what you want. I mean, Perisic, eight assists, I think, from 24 games or something. So that's what's needed. And I said this last week, you know, I think is that the pressure is on Ryan Sessegnon because Perisic has kind of proved, unless he has a massively um, massive decline, you know, I think he turns 34 soonish, a couple of weeks, maybe months, I can't remember. But, you know, unless he has a massive decline, I think the pressure is more on Sessegnon um, to keep trying to progress and improve because old Destiny, young Destiny, He's going to come in um, and he's going to make a real waves, I think, in that uh, that area. He's, well, as Andrea Sutel said, extraordinary. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to see what he brings to the Tottenham Hotspur shirt. Staying in Italy, Harry Wink, Sampdoria, he's at. Uh, finally, he's been able to be in a matchday squad. If you've missed this, Harry Winks has had a bit of a nightmare. He had, a, he had an ankle problem. Harry Winks has, all, has had long had ankle problems. Um, I remember Poch telling me once that he, you know, he was just going to have to play through it. Essentially, um, it's just going to be something uh, that he needs to um, yeah, manage in his career. But this time, it was bad enough that it required surgery. Had to have surgery, um, and honestly, I, bet, I think he'd had one training session with um, with Sampdoria um, in the whole time since he joined, and training away with teammates when he did on his own and just rubbish for him. And they're struggling, Sampdoria. You know, they're down the bottom. They're six points adrift of safety. I wrote that down after 17 games. But he was back on the bench. Didn't play, but it was massive progress for him to be back on, on the bench. They lost 2-0 to Napoli. Tongi on Dembele's Napoli. We're going to talk about them in a bit. Um, he put on Instagram the next day, after a long and very difficult time injured, it was good to finally be with the team last night. Last month, actually, he did an interview. I didn't see it uh, before. He did it with Samp News 24. He said, at the moment, I feel good. I'm proceeding gradually with recovery. In fact, it's only been six weeks since my operation, so I need time to get back into shape. Now that I'm training separately on the field, I have the opportunity to see my teammates and have a comparison. I'm still physically behind them, but every day is a little bit more, and for me, it's a small win. This was about four weeks ago, this interview, by the way. Um, so hopefully he's in a better physical shape now, which is why I was in the squad. Um, and there was some suggestions that his loan might get cut short, to which he said, I absolutely want to play for Sampdoria. The last four months have been very complicated for the team and also for me. Lots of bad work. Uh, sorry, lots of bad luck. I'm working hard to come back, including the holidays. It was and is frustrating not being able to play or train with the team. But I have to stay strong and aim for the goal. And I trust that in the next five months in the league, uh, we'll be able to do well. So, yeah, hopefully Harry Wink's back on the mend and, um, yeah, doing, you know, getting his career back on track, really. So, yeah, Tongi. Mention him briefly there because Sam Dory did play Napoli. Um, completing the hat-trick of Tottenham players in Italy is Tongi. Uh, he's been getting game time. I would say he's kind of been, been more back on the bench recently, coming off the bench. He comes on almost in every game. Uh, he's played 20 times now. He's 26. Winks is 26. Everyone's grown. All these lone players have um, all had their birthdays in the last couple of months, interestingly. It's not interesting, but they have. Um, yeah. He's had a substitute role past three matches. Came on for the final 24 minutes uh, against Sampdoria. There was a match against Inter, 1-0 defeat. I don't know if you see If you haven't or not, there was a bit of a, uh, footage after the game so Luciano Spalletti, the Napoli boss, they're doing very well Napoli, by the way. They're runaway leaders of Serie A at the moment. I think they're about seven points clear. So he came on the pitch at the end, you know, when the, you see the manager walking among the players after the final whistle. Um, and he came over towards Ondebele and started shouting at him. And he was shouting in English, uh, presumably because Ondebele, that's there, would be a common language. Or he doesn't speak Italian. But he was shouting at him, why you stay there? Why you stay there? And he was kind of pointing at an area of the pitch. Uh, presumably, I don't know, presumably maybe meaning that he didn't run back for something. Um, just questioning why he stayed in a certain area of the pitch. So you can kind of draw whatever conclusions you want from it. Ondembele seemed to kind of give his side of things and he kind of turned away at one point. It was all quite awkward. 
look it up on Twitter. It's on there. I think a few websites did stories on it as well. Um, I mean, whatever it was, it, it must have been smoothed over because when he played against Sampdoria, he got more time than he did against Inter. So it was obviously resolved in private. Um, you know, it's one of those things. Should you really be doing that and, and having that all out there on the pitch in front of the camera? I don't know. Or whether that was something that Spalletti thought tactically might, um, you know, I guess, uh, I don't know. Sometimes Managers try everything sometimes with these very exciting flair players who sometimes get criticised for the other side of the game, you know. Um, sometimes yeah, they just try things in private. Sometimes they try things in public. But um, yeah, so that's Tongi. That's how he's getting on. He could be another player that goes from Tottenham and wins a trophy. <laughs> could win the league title with Napoli the way they're going. Um, obviously, Spurs will want him to sign uh, for them permanently at the end of it. I think there is. If I'm trying to remember, I think they're pretty sure there is a, a an option to buy on that one as well. But. Um, yeah, he's probably going to have to start breaking in starting regularly. You'd imagine for that to be a thing. Uh, Joe Roden, switching to France. He's at Rennes. Um, he's really been out of the team recently. He had a bit of bad luck. I mean, he uh, he got suspended after a red card. Then he was ill. And then after that, he just kind of found himself dropped. I think Rennes have had a couple of players, a, a very talented young players. Names got out of my head, came back from injury. Uh, so, yeah, Joe Roden's on the bench. He was unused substitute at the weekend. They won 2 1 at Bordeaux in the Coupe de France in the third round. Um, yeah, he needs some minutes. I'm trying to think when the last time he played. He hasn't featured in League uh, since the middle of October, obviously, before the World Cup. We know we had the break and everything. Um, from what I understand, it, if it continues in this way and all parties agree, he could return from loan in January. Maybe head off somewhere else or probably head off if he were to come back. Um, yeah, we'll have to see what happens, but he needs to play football. One guy who is playing football again, thankfully for him, Sergio Reguilon. Um, oh, he's had a 2022 to forget. He really has. Um, I'm happy for him that he's back. I really do, because he's he's got minutes from the bench now in three La Liga matches in a row, and the Copa del Rey also played in as well. Um, so if you're not aware what happened with Sergio Reguilon, he's also now 26. Add that to your trivia list. Um, he... Had a groin issue back in April. You remember he missed the end of the season with Spurs. Um, but that really, really kind of kept him out. And he needed surgery on it. So he didn't kind of return until the end of October that he could even play for Atletico. But then also, even when he was um, came back, he had like a really awful, like some kind of stomach problem that left him in hospital. He's just had him. If you've seen his Instagram, he put up a really kind of traumatic looking video of him in a hospital bed looking very worse for wear. Um, and he put like a caption next to it. The worst year of my life is over. Unfortunately, this photo symbolises my year. It has been a year of much pain, suffering, injection, surgeries and more surgeries. I haven't been able to do anything for eight months while football is my life. I kept wondering when I would finally be a football player again. I'm very grateful to those who have stood by my side during these difficult times. I also want to thank everyone at Atletico Madrid for their trust and the way they've welcomed me. I felt love from day one. I'm convinced that all those bad moments I had to endure have made me a stronger person. This will serve me well both in football and in life. The year ends in the best possible way. Finally, I'm back. So yeah, he got eight minutes from the bench at the defeat, one 0 defeat against Barcelona on Sunday. Fourteen minutes at Real Oviedo in the cup in midweek. Um, so yeah, good for him. He's back. He is back on the uh, on the pitch. So that's the main thing for him. Um, Giovanni de Celso, unfortunately, he is still out with his injury he picked up pre World Cup that saw him miss out on that. I think he went out to Qatar as well to join in the celebrations because obviously not playing at the moment anyway. Uh, and you know he played his part in getting them to the World Cup, so you know it does deserve to be a bit of those celebrations. So we'll see what happens with de Celso. As I said before, I'm pretty sure that there's this clause, uh, like a recall, a break clause in a way. That if Spurs were to get an offer for him this month, they could call him back and sell him if he agreed to that. Um, but it's a bit difficult with him injured. I don't know whether that's actually going to happen or he'll end up just staying at Villarreal for the rest. Um, one person who is on their way back from injury, Troy Parrott at Preston. Um, he should be back soon now. If you're not where he picked up a bit of a freak hamstring injury after a goal. Scored the winning goal for... Um, Preston against Norwich back in October, early October. 
Um, so Preston Boss Ryan Lowe was just waiting for the green light really from Spurs. When you're a lone player, of course, it's the parent club that decide when they're ready for action. Um, and a quote from him this week. Troy has trained well the last four days. He's been given the all clear by Tottenham. Saturday in the FA Cup, sorry, it was just before the FA Cup, might come too soon for him. Um, and we have to be cautious. So I think Preston have got, fun enough, Norwich uh, coming to them this weekend. So maybe in the game he scored in, he could potentially come back on the bench for, you'd hope. Um, so yeah, fingers crossed for him. That would have been very frustrating. And then you've got Dane Scarlett. Dane Scarlett could not play uh, for Spurs against uh, Portsmouth um, in the third round of the FA Cup, as we all saw. Um, I think I said this in the last video. I did see him down in the tunnel having a good old chin wag with Sonny who gave him a big hug when he saw him. Um, I'm trying to remember. I think I read out this quote. Simon Bassey. Uh, yes, I did. I did read it out. So I'm not going to read it out again. But ultimately, yeah, Spurs are going to have a decision to make on him. Portsmouth don't want to lose him. They think he's been a good loan and he'll continue to give them more. Uh, but obviously he didn't play in that game. And the reason I was looking across here earlier was that last night Portsmouth played Bolton away in the, um, I think it was Johnson Paint Trophies. I can't remember what it's called nowadays. Um, I was just looking at the lineups, and he was, oh no he was, sorry. Weirdly, it's because he's on the left wing in the 4-4-2, which I can't imagine is where he played. They must have got that formation wrong. But it looks like... Well, they lost 1-0 anyway, so he didn't score. Just trying to see how many minutes he got, so I can update this little bit for you. He played for... Oh, did it come off? No, I've completely lost where he's come off. Great video. Oh, there we are. 72 minutes. So he got 72 minutes under his belt. Um, so that's good. That's good. More minutes. Now it's just up to all the clubs to decide. So Papa John's Trophy, that was the name of it. I had it written down as well. Um, that was the quarterfinals. Um, but yeah, played, didn't score. Spurs now have to decide exactly what happens next with him and whether he, most loan Spurs do have a, a recall uh, in January, especially, I mean, more academy players they do. So that's the loan roundup. Um, obviously, now we look forward to, hopefully look forward to Arsenal at the weekend. Uh, I've got the press conference on Friday. Training-wise, as of yesterday, Kulisevsky was back doing individual training, um, which hopefully means he should be able to play a part on Sunday. He's outdoors doing stuff. Uh, Basuma's back in training after his ankle injury. Haven't heard anything or seen anything so far as of yesterday. I must admit, I've been off today, so I haven't checked in that regard with Benton Kerr or Richarlison. Benton Kerr, there was a hope that he could be involved on Sunday. So what are we at now? Wednesday. There's a few more days for him to maybe be involved enough to be on the bench, you'd think. Richarlison was always going to be a bit more of a long shot because it would be ahead of schedule if he got to Sunday. But, you know, like I said before, if there's any chance of him getting on that bench, you'd think Spurs would take it and he would take it as long as there's no risk involved. And Lucas, yeah, we don't really know anything about Lucas at the moment. It's all very much up in the air. Um, I'm waiting to see what happens with him and when he returns. But we shall find out on Friday. We finally get a Conte presser after, obviously, Christian Cellini did a couple for us in midweek with Conte not feeling in the best of ways. But obviously, um, Gianluca Vialli's death, which was incredibly sad. Um, so there you go. That's really it at the moment, to be honest, to talk about. Um Filled a, filled a fair whack there without having a a um, a match to talk about. Yeah, so like I say, on the Qatar stuff, we'll see what happens. But very much early days at the moment. Um, especially, you know, um, especially from Tottenham's point of view, say nothing's happened. Um, and those financial results, well, you, you know my opinion on that because you heard that earlier. Um, but there we go, Tottenham Hotspur. What a club. So yeah, transfer stuff should start heating up now. Um, I want to. I want to. I'm going to spend the rest of this week. This is the one thing, good thing about having less matches and presses. It frees me up to properly start kind of digging around and asking stuff. So we should get, or I should get more stuff on potential targets. I think Spurs are trying to work under the radar as they should. Um, they're always a club that are worried about others coming. I mean, even Poro, we've seen. You know, some places have linked Chelsea and Barcelona with him. Other places have said Spurs are the only ones looking at him. Um, it's 
Spurs are often, when they'll come up with a signing, they'll try to do it later on. There'll always be one that drags on and on and on. Um, I think the Summers was probably Jed Spence, which ironically, you know, he's barely played any football. Excuse me. Um, you know, could Poros be this one, or could he? Could instead the uh, the main transfer be one that we're not aware of, and suddenly we find out about it when it's very advanced. Personally, although it's frustrating as a journalist, they are probably the best deals to do because you've got less chance of someone swooping in late on because you know you've convinced the player um, and agreed stuff with the club. So, yeah, fingers crossed. What are we now? 11th of January, got 20 days or so left. There's enough time to get stuff done. Um, I'm not going to start getting too worried until that window is slam shut. Um, if you can slam a... Um, a not real window, um, because of last January. Last January, I felt Spurs could have done more, and it ended up being one of the best January windows I can remember from Spurs. They were transformative, those two players. So, yeah, I'll wait to see. My ju my judgment will be re reserved, as it were. Um, but I just hope, I hope that they get them right. I'm not even that fussed about throwing money at it, because like I say, last January proved that doesn't need to be done. I just want them to make key important additions like they did. That's the key thing for me. So, right, I'm going to head off now. Um, as always, stay healthy, stay safe. I shall uh, and look after yourselves, of course. I shall talk to you later, probably Monday after North London Derby. I've got a lovely trip to Manchester after that, which I'm going to have to stay over the night because um, the fixture people... Seem to have very little regard for fans and uh, a journalist, clearly. Um, so, yeah. So that's going to be an interesting one as well at the Etihad. It's one of those, I just hope that Spurs, because they've done so well there in so many of the trips, it's not one of those where it horribly goes the other way. Um, fingers crossed it doesn't. And they have another brilliant night that they did uh, last season. Yeah, did the double last season. Whew, what days. Uh, so there you go. Right, I'm going to head off. Uh, as as I said before, stay healthy, stay safe, look after yourselves, and I shall catch you later. Goodbye.